Okay, uh, welcome to um, this third day of the International Marxist University. It has been a tremendous success so far. We're all very pleased with uh, the uh, attendees. Um, uh, for those of you who are new visitors to, to the uh, event, you will notice that we're waiting, we're pausing uh, every once in a while. Uh, and that is uh, to make space for translation. Uh, and for those of you who would like some translation, you'll find the links to the translations on the left-hand side uh, in the event page. Uh, also, the way to choose which session you're watching is to click the star on the left hand side uh, where you can see the schedule of all the different events and you can also watch the events that took place yesterday and the day before from those links And uh, today uh, we're going to discuss uh, sp spontaneity and anarchism. Uh, and John Peterson from the United States will be leading off. For about uh, one and a half hours. And then we will have uh, some time, uh, a break after that. Uh, and after that, we'll have uh, four or five comrades who will come in to speak. And then uh, John will be summing up the discussion. Uh, and then we will uh, end the session there. Uh, so, uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand it over to John. Okay. okay, well, thank you, Comrade Chair, and thank you, Comrades. As we saw in the discussion on world perspectives, these are truly unprecedented times. <clears throat> and nowhere is this more evident than in the United States itself. Now, for weeks after the murder of George Floyd, mass protests raged and the state was thrown off balance. <clears throat> A police precinct in Minneapolis was burnt down. Uh, the world's most powerful man was forced to hide in a bunker. <clears throat> Armed self-defense patrols emerged in working class neighborhoods. The entire west coast of the United States and of Canada was shut down by the longshore workers, by the dock workers. <clears throat> and a few blocks of the city of Seattle were declared an autonomous police free zone. Zona 
And so it seemed as though the George Floyd movement had endless reserves. Entonces parecería que el movimiento George Floyd tenía reservas ilimitadas. As though, as though the raging river would never recede back into its banks. Como si el río desbordado nunca iba a volver a su cauce. The depth and the breadth of the movement was, was really exhilarating. La profundidad y la amplitud del movimiento fue exhilarante. But we understood that if it was not given a revolutionary expression, it could not continue at that scale indefinitely. Pero entendimos que si continuaba a, a esa, de esa forma, sin, sin tener una expresión revolucionaria, no podría continuar para siempre en esa misma escala. And that's the number one lesson of dialectics, that nothing lasts forever. And so the mass movement inevitably ebbed in most areas. El movimiento de masas decayó inevitablemente en muchas áreas. Although it has flared up again over the weekend in a few cities. Aunque ha resurgido de nuevo en alguna ciudad durante la semana. But we've seen that the movement's uncontrolled spontaneity was one of its greatest strengths. Vimos que la espontaneidad del movimiento descontrolado fue una de sus grandes fortalezas. But it was also a fatal flaw. Pero también fue una falla fatal. But who can deny the incredible potential that has been revealed? Pero quién puede negar el glorioso potencial que se reveló? And, 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 you know, who can't imagine what would have been possible if there had been a real and serious leadership in place? Now, with images of smashed windows and violent clashes between protesters and the police covering the televisions, Our dear leader, Donald Trump, declared the following. He said, quote, we are now in the process of defeating the radical left. <clears throat> the Marxists, the anarchists, the agitators, the looters, and people who in many instances have absolutely no clue what they are doing. Now, since Donald Trump is an ignoramus, who in many instances has absolutely no clue what he is doing, He lumped the Marxists in with the anarchists. But anyone with any familiarity with the matter knows that nothing could be further from the truth. Now, on the surface, there are what appear to be many points of agreement. Both Marxists and anarchists envision a world without states. Without religion. Without money. But as we'll see, Marxism and anarchism are fundamentally and irreconcilably opposed in both outlook and practice. Now, this is a vast topic and our time is very limited. So I'd like to focus on a few key things. Which we can then develop further in the discussion and the summing up. First off, we'll look at the philosophical differences between these two trends.
And we'll compare the ideas of Marxism with those of people like Stirner, Proudhon, Bakunin. And we'll take up the question of the state. What is it? What isn't it? Whose interests does it represent? And how can we replace the capitalist state with something fundamentally different? We'll also look at the question of organization. <clears throat> how can the workers best organize to prepare to confront the centralized power of the bourgeois state? Is the spontaneous energy of the masses enough? <clears throat> and finally, we'll take a look at the closely related question of political struggle. Is the way forward mass action, including political action? or individualism and abstention from politics altogether. <clears throat> is political power something to fight for or is it something we should abstain from out of principle? How should leaders be elected and, and held accountable? Or do we even need leaders at all? <clears throat> now to be sure there's, there's many variants, there's schools, different organizations and philosophies. <clears throat> there's virtually as many uh, of these as there are individual anarchists. So my intention is not to set up straw man arguments or to caricature our anarchism. <clears throat> but there are some generalizations that we can make. Now the essence of modern anarchism is summed up clearly by the anarchists themselves. in a widely available pamphlet called Anarchism, an introduction. And they say, quote, anarchists believe that the point of society is to widen the choices of individuals. This is the axiom upon which the anarchist case is founded. The ideal of anarchism is a society in which all individuals can do whatever they choose except interfere with the ability of other individuals to do what they choose. This ideal is called anarchy. From the Greek anarchia, meaning absence of government. So there you have it. In the final analysis, it's all about individuals, their self-interest, and their choices. Now, as with so many of the other political trends we're analyzing over the course of the school,
In essence, the difference between Marxism and anarchism boils down to materialism versus idealism. Uh, mass revolutionary working class politics versus petty bourgeois individualism. And the importance of having a strategy, program, tradition, and ideas that can actually change the world versus unfocused anger and impotence. Now, in the final analysis, all philosophies express the viewpoint and interests of one or another class or layer of a class. And as we still live in a society divided into classes, there really is nothing fundamentally new under the sun when it comes to ideology. What are presented as new or fresh ideas are really nothing but a rehash of pre-Marxist and anti-Marxist ideas. <clears throat> now, as comrades know, Marxism is a materialist dialectical theory. It's distilled from the real motion of nature and society. And is then reapplied to the living world. And in particular to the movement of the working class in its life and death struggle against capital. It's the most advanced form of human thinking yet developed. It's an intellectual lightsaber that can show the way forward through the darkness and confusion and slice through all the ideological obstacles in its path. So Marxist theory is an indispensable weapon in the fight for world socialism. It embraces contradiction, change and motion Now, anarchist theory, on the other hand, is a form of subjective idealism, of utopian socialism, in which verbal radicalism is combined with paternalistic sectarianism. So anarchism is rooted in petty bourgeois and even lumpen proletarian individualism. And everything else flows from this. Now as a class, the petty bourgeoisie is squeezed between the titanic pressure of the big bourgeoisie and the workers. As a result, their outlook and their ideas are unstable inconsistent, confused, erratic, 
and very often outright hostile to the working class. And especially to the organized working class. And for all their apparent radicalism, anarchist ideas are really uh, just mired in insoluble contradictions. Marx called Proudhon's ideas absurd. And he was trying to be polite. Now, as, as Trotsky famously quipped, as Trotsky said, he said, anarchist theory is like an umbrella full of holes, useless precisely when you need it. Uh, as a form of subjective idealism, anarchism conceives of the world in abstract categories. divorced from contradiction and the real world. So for example, concepts like freedom and solidarity are seen as eternal and inherent attributes of humans. <clears throat> as something universal, permanent and fixed. and not as something conditioned by time and place and on the overall social context we live in. <clears throat> and although uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon is often referred to as the father of anarchism, Uh, its real philosophical foundations can be traced to the former young Hegelian, Max Stirner. Now, for Stirner, religion, conscience, morality, law, the family, and the state, all these things, Uh, they're merely despotic abstractions imposed on the individual. Which the I, the ego, must struggle against by any means necessary. So in short, it's, it's as though I recognize nothing above myself. I feel oppressed by every institution that imposes any duty on me. But he's concerned not only with the individual's ego, but with the individual ego and his property. And as everybody knows, the world is basically like Mad Max out there. And an egoist can only retain their property as long as other egoists don't take it away from them. So flowing from this, Stirner opposes the state because it deprives the individual of absolute freedom 
and untrammeled access to individual property. And of course, as a result, he's vehemently opposed to communism. As a rabid defender of individual property, <coughs> he rebels against any state that infringes on the rights of private uh, proper uh, property. So what this really reflects is the utopia of the enraged petty bourgeoisie. which lashes out blindly at forces beyond their control or comprehension. Now, if Stirner sounds a lot like the ranting of today's radical right-wing libertarians, It's because these ideas have precisely the same class origin. This is essentially the same worldview as people like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. As the website of the Mises Institute declares, Quote, if capitalism did not exist, it would be necessary to invent it. And its discovery would be rightly regarded as one of the great triumphs of the human mind. So this is subjective idealism, pure and simple. And it's the very opposite of scientific socialism. And it's not an accident that both the anarchists and the libertarian right use precisely the same playbook when it comes to attacking Marxism. Equating Leninism with Stalinism. Bolshevism with tyranny. Uh, so, uh, socialism with fascism and, and so on. Now, as for Proudhon, the other father of anarchism, he was also a utopian. And as philosophical idealists, the utopian socialists believe that ideas are primary. And so all that is needed to improve the world is for a man of genius to come along and discover a perfect social organization. Now, Proudhon believed that he was just such a man of genius. But it was Marx who revealed the great secret to understanding human history. And that's that the structure of society ultimately depends upon its class relations the degree of development of its productive forces, and that in the final analysis, conditions determine consciousness, not the other way around.
Real social change results from objective changes in our material conditions. Not through the mere subjective will of individuals. So, for example, uh, Proudhon believes that God does not exist. That he's a figment of our imagination and a product of ignorance. And that's fair enough as a starting point. But he then applies the same logic to the state. Which he considers to be a quote. A phantasmagoria of our brain. Which it would be the first duty of free reason to relegate to the museums and libraries. However, the state, as we all know, is something very real. Anyone who's been at a protest in the last few weeks knows this firsthand. It's been developed and conditioned over hundreds and thousands of years to serve a very definite purpose, as we'll see. So to view the state as a mere fiction may sound super radical on the surface. But it's actually a totally impotent analysis. Because if we're unable to understand the real origins and evolution of the state, and above all, its class content and its role in society, we will be unable to successfully confront and overthrow it. In fact, Proudhon's worldview is completely devoid of class analysis. In his view, the people in the abstract should be reconciled. And unite for the greater good under the influence of pure reason. <clears throat> and as a representative of the petty bourgeoisie, Proudhon constantly oscillated between radicalism and conservatism. but always within the limits of individual private ownership of the means of production. Now his great contribution was the idea of mutualism. And this is the idea that every worker should receive back in exchange from the pool of social wealth exactly the amount of wealth he or she contributed to it. So in other words, it's a glorified barter system.
governed by the labor theory of value. The free market. And a system of mutual credits. And apparently society has no need for a social fund to pay for things like infrastructure, schools, healthcare, etc. And so Proudhon, he, he detests big capital in the state. because they deprive individuals of their freedom to enjoy 100% of the fruits of their labor. But he also rails against the idea of the working class expropriating the exploiters. and establishing a democratically planned economy. For Proudhon, communism is an unjust tyranny and just as bad as capitalism. <laughs> so it's not about, it's not a question of ending the system of commodity production par excellence, capitalism. but of strengthening the hold that commodities have on society. And far from abolishing the state as an institution of class rule, it seeks to devolve its functions to a lower level. to the municipalities, the departments, and so on. So in place of one great centralized capitalist state, he advocates a vast number of small statelets. But in a sea of small commodity producers, uh, in a sea of small commodity producers, the laws of commodity production will eventually lead to the larger producers gobbling up the smaller ones. concentrating ever greater economic power into fewer hands. And you'd see a similar process of concentration with all the, the little, little statelets. So instead of moving society forward, by taking the existing means of production to the next level, by bringing them under democratic public control on a world scale. <clears throat> Proudhon wants to take society backwards. To an idyllic, pre-capitalist, petty bourgeois fantasy land. Which never actually existed in reality. As for Bakunin, who is seen by many as the, the Attila the Hun of anarchism, Uh, 
uh, you'll, we'll see that it's really just a reiteration of the same ideas with this or that modification. For example, he called it collectivism instead of mutualism. And though he tried to, to give anarchism a, a sort of materialist basis, he did this very superficially, and very badly. He never understood dialectics. And in practice, he remained an idealist uh, and a petty bourgeois individualist. Now, as his model for the new society, he had in mind the backwards small scale artisans of rural Switzerland. For example, the watchmakers of the Jura region. Uh, as well as lumpens and peasants generally. All of whom were alleged to be more revolutionary than the working class. which had been corrupted by life in big factories and cities. He called for, quote, the economic and social equalization of classes. So not the end of classes, but their equalization. He put a lot of emphasis on the right, uh, the need to abolish the right of inheritance. He believed that the state was responsible for inventing this right. And that this is what perpetuates inequality. But of course, the right to inheritance is not something randomly invented by the state. It's a function of a society in which there's private property of the means of production. And huge concentrations of wealth that can be passed on from generation to generation. Now, Bakunin was an opportunist and an intriguer. And he had no problem working with nihilist lumpen sociopaths. like the infamous Sergei Nechayev. But he also had no problem working within bourgeois parties. In fact, it was only when he reached a dead end working in a bourgeois party that he turned his massive ego to the first international. Where he made an unholy mess of things and helped bring about the destruction of the international after the Paris Commune.
So there you have it, comrades. These are the founding fathers of anarchism. Now, one of the key lessons of the George Floyd movement is that you can't meaningfully fight against the state without also fighting against capitalism. <clears throat> because the state that oppresses us isn't an abstract state, it's a capitalist state. As we've seen, the anarchists believe that the state is just simply bad. It's an authoritarian infringement on their right to absolute personal liberty. But as the great Marxists explained, uh, the state is a very real power And it reflects, it reflects very real economic and class interests. The state is a power rising from society. But placing itself above it. and alienating itself more and more from it. It consists of special bodies of armed men and women, enjoying a monopoly of organized violence with the support of prisons, courts, and institutions of coercion of all kinds. Now it appears on the stage of history along with the rise of classes, but far from reconciling divergent class interests, It's a product and a manifestation of the irreconcilable nature of, of class antagonisms. And it serves to defend the interests of one class in particular, the ruling class over the rest of society. So our starting point has to be, what class interests does this or that state represent? Now Bakunin, for example, he also thought that the state was responsible for creating classes. And because of his ahistorical and idealist understanding of the state, he believed that even a, he believed that even a worker state would lead inevitably to the rise of a new minority that would oppress the majority. Now, Marxists, on the other hand, understand the need for a worker state. As a transitional form. It would represent and defend the rule of the majority over the minority of former exploiters. And it would serve, it would serve to coordinate 
It would serve to coordinate the transition to a nationalized, democratically planned economy. Now, unlike the Russians a century ago, who inherited terrible backwardness and barbarism from czarism, A modern socialist state would inherit an economy with a comparatively high level of development of the productive forces. It would mobilize the masses to defend the revolution. And on the basis of a rationally planned economy, society would have the capacity to provide more than enough for everybody in a very short space of time. And so the coercive role of a state, like a capitalist state, which represents the, the minority over the majority would very rapidly diminish. And so over time, on the basis of equality of life for all, class distinctions themselves would begin to fade away. And I think this uh, would happen quite quickly, in my opinion. Given the belated nature of the socialist revolution, and the degree to which the productive forces have developed within capitalism, even if it's happened in a very distorted way. So once there's no longer an opposing class to coerce, the state as an instrument of class rule will wither away and it will be replaced by the non-coercive administration of things. So to get rid of the state, we have to get rid of classes. And you can't just wish these things away. The, the ruling class will never give up its power without a fight. And furthermore, the capitalist state apparatus cannot be simply taken over by the workers to serve our interests. A very different kind of state is needed. Instead of a power standing above society, a worker state would be the organic expression of the majority. It would be comprised of democratically elected neighborhood and workplace committees. These would be linked up locally, regionally, nationally. In the Russian Revolution, these were known as Soviets. And uh, the four basic conditions 
for beginning the work of coordinating a worker state. Uh, are, are as follows. That's the election and recall of all public officials at all levels. No official to receive more pay than a skilled worker. All these positions should be rotated regularly. As Lenin put it, every cook should be able to be prime minister. And these measures alone would go a long way towards fighting uh, careerism and bureaucracy. But the fourth condition is that instead of a minority of specialized oppressors as we have today, you would have the armed masses themselves. Elected and accountable in defense of the revolution. And these kinds of organs uh, rise in every revolutionary situation in situations of, of dual power. And this is a qualitatively different kind of state. Given its vastly different class composition, it would in reality be a semi-state as, as Engels put it. And so we as Marxists, we're absolutely in favor of this kind of state. In fact, one of the most exciting things about the recent protests was the organic emergence of neighborhood defense committees. And this represented the embryo of the embryo of dual power of workers' power. And its emergence in the US is really pregnant with revolutionary implications for the future. But it's not only a question of what the workers should do during the revolution or once they've won political power. It's a question of preparing to win power in the first place. And like everything else we do, Our strategy, tactics, and organizational methods flow from our class perspective. The working class is a collective class. <laughs> and we base ourselves on the need for mass collective class independent action. Anarchism, on the other hand, bases itself on the individual, as we've seen. It rejects the idea that we need leaders. That we need a disciplined organization. That we need to study theory and prepare for revolution. Instead, they rely almost entirely on spontaneity.
But this has severe limits, as we've seen. So instead of a party, prepare it in advance. With a clear program and transparent membership and leadership structures. Bakunin's vision was of a conspiracy. Of an unelected, quote, secret universal association of international brothers. And he, he believed that two or 300 revolutionaries are enough for the largest country's organization. And so if that's all that was needed, many sections of the IMT would already be on the eve of power. So Bakunin accused Marx of, quote, ruining the workers by making theorists out of them. <clears throat> because apparently all you need is instincts, not theory, in order for the revolution to be victorious. And of course, this is the very opposite of Bolshevism. <clears throat> yes, the energy of the masses is the motor force of revolution. A small group cannot force the working class to move into action before it's ready. But the key point is this. In the heat of a revolution, there's no time to experiment or to learn by trial and error. Now, revolutions are not as rare as the bourgeois would have us believe. But they don't come too often in any single country in any single lifetime. We can't waste these opportunities because failure and defeat can have disastrous and even deadly consequences. We understand revolutionary processes dialectically. And understand that the spontaneous energy of the masses needs to be channeled via an organization with a program, perspectives, strategy, tactics worked out in advance. Which is rooted in the class. And, and that's a revolutionary party made up of experienced Marxist caters. Now, a cater organization is like the muscle memory of the working class. Cater is a, is a military term. And the caters are the commissioned and non-commissioned officers specialists in military history, strategy and tactics and they're the ones that drill up 
and train the millions of raw recruits when there's a general mobilization for war. And it's similar with the class struggle. <laughs> After a long period of hibernation, Uh, a prolonged ebb in the open class struggle. When the workers first begin to flex their muscles and to move into action, they'll inevitably be disoriented and hesitant But trained Bolshevik caters can rapidly and efficiently transmit the collective lessons of our class. The past victories and defeats. The theory and the organizational forms. What works, what doesn't work? and accelerate the process of training up the proletarian army for its confrontation with capital. Now, although anarchist organizations, or as they're often called, collectives do exist, they typically operate on the basis of consensus because of course nobody wants to impose their view on anybody else. <laughs> but of course, this means that any individual has veto power over the majority. And this is the most undemocratic organizational form possible. This is the kind of impotent demoralizing structure that was at the heart of the Occupy movement. As well as in the Chaz Chop occupation in Seattle. Now, of course, since anarchist organizations don't have clearly defined structures, usually they don't have, you know, elected leaders who are accountable and so on. They're often run very undemocratically, often as the personal tyranny of whoever has the strongest personality. Or, or through unelected cliques. And the reality is that in every human relationship, we must subordinate a part of our autonomy and freedom. But in exchange, we get a whole that is far greater and stronger than the sum of its parts. <clears throat> in a Bolshevik organization, we voluntarily agree to abide by the majority decision. after having had a free and democratic opportunity to make the case for our ideas and positions. But our collective strength from, flows from that unity and action.
And undermining that collective strength in the name of the rights of the individual is basically like strike breaking and sabotage. Now, another conception of anarchism is that the organization should be a microcosm of a future society. Now, many anarchists seem to think that it's possible to live without classes or the state or money in the miniature bubble. Starting with themselves, of course, liberating themselves. Within capitalism itself. In a collective or a commune or through so-called guerrilla gardening. Uh, but Marxists view the revolutionary organization very differently. We understand that it is a specialized and essential tool that is needed by the working class to smash through the barriers of capitalism. So we can start building a new society, but it is not the new society itself. Now, most anarchists believe that workers sh should be in unions. Though they often create their own unions like the IWW. Uh, but they transform this basically correct idea into a magic key that can supposedly solve all questions. Because as important as unions are, they are not in and of, of themselves enough. As Marx explained, to fight as a class in the interest of all workers against the interest of all capitalists, we also need political struggle. This is why the demand of some anarchists, one big union, uh, can't in and of itself end capitalist exploitation and oppression. Workers' control over production on the shop floor is not enough. And worker-owned cooperatives are definitely not enough. You can't artificially separate economic and political struggle. Now, it's absolutely true that workers' organizations and parties can be bureaucratized. They can degenerate. Uh, individual leaders can be bought off. They can wear out. And unfortunately, there's no 100% guarantee that this won't happen. just as there's no guarantee that your knife won't get dull if you don't take care of it and keep it sharp. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We fight reformism 
with revolution. We fight against corruption with accountability. Against cliques and secrets with transparency and internal democracy. But the anarchists lump all parties Uh, uh, yeah, uh, into the same category, whether they're liberal or conservative bourgeois parties. Whether they're uh, reformist or bureaucratized workers parties. Or a revolutionary Bolshevik party. They condemn them all. And again, this is an ahistorical and very confused conception. So of course, our aim is not to create a reformist parliamentary party that can negotiate the terms of our servitude with the capitalists. We aim to forge a political and organizational spear that can pierce the system's heart and kill it once and for all. Now, a healthy revolutionary party requires an active and engaged membership. But above all, it requires a truly revolutionary program that transcends capitalism and, and has that historic strategic aim in mind. Now, unless and until we are in a position to replace the farce of bourgeois democracy with mass revolutionary politics, we must, in many cases, participate in bourgeois elections. Though we have no illusions that these elections can in and of themselves bring about fundamental change. We don't abandon the workers to the reformists. We place positive demands on the reformist leaders and expose them in practice, not by merely denouncing them. And we never give a critical support to the reformists, nor do we join bourgeois governments. We participate in the workers' struggles and we put forward clear transitional demands that can raise the political horizons of the workers. in order to help them draw the conclusion that we need a socialist revolution. And it's through this process that the limited nature of reforms and of the reformists are exposed. But most anarchists would argue that the right, the right to vote shouldn't be exercised
because it merely sows illusions in the system. Their approach is pretty straightforward. Basically, they say power is evil, so don't touch power or you will be tainted by evil. But of course, as Trotsky explained, to abstain from the fight for political power is to leave power in the hands of those who currently have it. This is a completely sterile and reactionary position and no one learns from this process. Now, a classic example of how mistakes in theory lead to disaster in practice was during the Spanish Revolution. Now, in the midst of the revolution, the old state power collapsed under the pressure of the masses. But the leaders of the anarchist CNT refused to take power out of principle. Now, later on, when the revolution was in a, in a much worse situation, they joined the bourgeois government. Ten minutes left now, John. Uh, and this gave the government left cover and it sowed enormous confusion among the workers. And this deeply undermined the struggle against Franco. And most modern anarchists would accuse those CNT leaders of abandoning anarchist principles. But the real issue is that they didn't, that the CNT did not take power in the first place when it was there for the taking. And of course, a, a victorious socialist revolution in Spain in the 1930s would have changed the whole world. Now, when power is on the streets, you must be prepared to take it. You can't hesitate, you can't vacillate, you can't respectfully hand it back to the bourgeoisie. So to be prepared to act decisively at the decisive moment your entire strategy and organizational psychology even must be aimed at the winning of power for the working class. And it's not a question of imposing our will on the masses, which isn't possible anyway. But insofar as our ideas correspond with the experience of the workers, at a particular stage of the class struggle, uh, insofar as we're seen as hardworking, honest, and rooted in the class, After a series of successive approximations in which other parties and leaders are tested and found to be wanting,
the masses will give our ideas a chance if we're big enough for them to find that, find us at that moment. Now, the workers can see with their own eyes that the world is on fire. Billions of people are looking for a way out. All we're doing is offering a clear exit from the burning building. But knowing the way out of the burning building and having enough people in the right places to organize an orderly exit can't be improvised. So the task of revolutionary leadership prepared in advance is to accelerate that process. Or if you like to flatten the curve of the revolutionary crisis. And to lead it to a victorious conclusion as quickly, efficiently and peacefully as possible. Now, I've only been able to touch the surface of this really vast topic. It, it has a lot of layers. Um, other comments will come in and I can perhaps take up some other points in the summing up. But hopefully it sparked comrades' interest in learning more about Marxist theory generally, not just about Marxism versus anarchism. Because it's all interconnected. Comrades, people who are alive today have little or no previous experience of living through a revolution or a general strike or an uprising. But over the last few years, millions of people around the world have had precisely that experience. And now millions of Americans have joined their class sisters and brothers around the world in those experiences. Now, the key lesson is this, the state and the police do not exist in a vacuum. Political power and the economic power behind it cannot be simply ignored or wished away. A new power, a new state on a new class basis is the only way to successfully fight and replace the status quo. Now, the anarchist movement has produced some heroic and inspiring class fighters and martyrs. Many of the rank and file members of the CNT or of the North American IWW, the Wobblies, contained within them the embryo of Bolshevism. But class instincts and the will to sacrifice aren't enough. And to be frank, the class composition of the anarchist movement today is overwhelmingly petty bourgeois.
if not in class background, then in class outlook. And while many of them may invoke the name of the working class, they have no understanding of the contradictory way in which the working class actually moves. Now we should be, we should be friendly to young people uh, who, who come to us and consider themselves anarchists. Given the legacy of Stalinism and the avalanche of lies about Marx and Lenin, it's understandable that, that some young people will look to anarchism first. But we have to be implacable when it comes to fighting against anarchist ideology. As we've seen, it's the ideology of an alien class. These ideas, they don't help the struggle of the working class, but actually damage it and hold it back. These methods. Now, Marxists are also against authoritarianism. We're also against blindly following the leadership. We're against having an unelected and unaccountable leadership. But we have no problem recognizing political authority. The political authority of a leadership that's proven the correctness of its ideas and its methods time and again. Uh, through its analysis of events, its participation, the struggles of the world working class. And and this kind of authority has to be earned. It cannot be imposed from above. And we have no interest in imposing it from above. Now the IMT is in the process of earning our political authority in the eyes of the masses. of earning the right to lead the working class. And I think that our political authority has never been higher as exemplified by this extraordinary worldwide event. So we have to take the lessons from this discussion And, uh, and the lessons from the school and redouble our efforts to overthrow this historic, uh, this horrific system in the next historical period. Comrades, long live the ideas of Marxism. Long live the fight for socialism in our lifetime. And long live the IMT and the world working class. <laughs>